So we've been talking about your kingdom come, your kingdom come. And last week, oh my goodness, last week, did we ever have a time. By the time I left here last week, I could hardly speak. Um, My voice was just about gone. And I don't know when I have felt a greater anointing of the Lord. Um, And I, I know that it's a confirmation of what the Holy Spirit is speaking over our church. The main theme of everything Jesus said in all Matthew, Mark, Luke, when Jesus was teaching, you see over and over and over and over and over this theme of the kingdom. He used the phrase the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. They're three different phrases, and they're all used interchangeably, but literally it's all the way through the Bible, and we talked a little bit about that last week. Go all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis, you see God using kingdom language. Language. You take it all the way through to the end of Revelation and God sets up his kingdom all the way as he has intended all along from the beginning. Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. And I want you to take your Bibles and flip over to Matthew chapter 6 today. And we're going to read a little bit about kingdom praying. There's a difference in prayer and kingdom prayer. Are you with me there? Jesus said, when you pray, you should pray differently. He told his disciples, don't pray like the, anybody remember? Like the heathen. Don't pray like the heathen pray. Now that, that's kind of an odd statement, isn't it? You don't think of heathen as having a lot of prayer meetings. But what he was saying is, these people have a religious spirit, and they pray very religiously, but it is really about them. It's really not about their relationship with the Lord. It's something that they do to look pious. It's something that they do to be seen of men. I want you to catch that because what he's saying is they're operating in a worldly, earthly kingdom. They're praying, but their prayers are fleshly because they're doing it to be seen by men. They think that their prayers are important because other people are listening to them. He said, when you pray, you have to realize your prayers are not about fleshly, earthly, worldly, carnal things. It's not so that you can impress somebody so that they can hear how smart you are when you're praying. Your prayers aren't to them. We are on a whole nother level. He was saying your prayers are kingdom-minded prayers. When you pray, your audience isn't down here. Your audience is in heaven, right? And so as he gives the model prayer to the disciples, now this is a, a, a good model. It's one model in scripture and it's, it's an excellent model, but it's not meant to be a recited prayer only. Sometimes people say, well, let's just say the Lord's prayer And if you actually prayed through the Lord's Prayer and and did it as he intended, this is for you to be able to go before the Lord privately. It might take you an hour, might take you an hour. It's not just saying words over and over and over and, and repeating them. It's using this as your model. Is that good? So that's what he's saying here. He's saying that the heathen don't understand how to pray, but you're going to pray differently. And I want you to note... I hope you've been looking at the kingdom. I challenged you last week to start looking through the word and researching the kingdom. Some of you sent me scriptures this week about the king and about the kingdom. I hope that you're working on that because God will give you more revelation about the kingdom than, you could, than I would even be able to speak to you in this series on Sunday morning. Look at chapter uh, 6 verse 9 and you'll see that he's telling us about kingdom prayer. He said, in this manner therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Now, I've preached a whole series on the Lord's Prayer before, and you could literally take just the first word of this prayer, our, and I, I did one sermon just on that word when we pray, okay? Uh, so you can go back and you can look at those. I'm not going to re-preach that. But the first thing that he tells us is when you begin to pray, understand your audience isn't earthly. Your audience is in heaven. And when you begin to pray, even when you are alone, and he was specifically talking about going into your closet and praying when other people aren't hearing you, but he did not use the word my, he used the word our. So that's, that's a plural pronoun that he used there. So that when you're praying and you feel alone, you need to understand your prayer is coming up to God. It is coming right before the throne room along with prayers of millions of saints all around this globe. And he hears every one. That you, when you stand in prayer, you never stand alone. Our Father in heaven. So we already know this is a kingdom prayer because it's to heaven. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Now, let me just say this really quick about this statement. The first thing when you pray, you need to know him and have relationship with who he is. Our goal when we come to the Lord is to say, Lord, I'm lifting your name. I'm saying, hallowed be your name name. I am praising. I'm saying your name is to be exalted and worshiped. Your name is pure. Your name is holy. Your name is to be above every other name. You're lifting up his name. And then after you lift up his name in worship, what's the first request you should make? Your kingdom come. I want to just ask you, when was the last time that you prayed that? When was the last time that you prayed, Lord, let your kingdom come? The church, if we follow what Jesus said, number one on our prayer request list ought to be, let your kingdom come. It's not secondary to anything else. He said once you know him, once you know where he is and you've reverenced his name, then the first thing is you need to say, God, let your kingdom go. Can I tell you this? When you get a revelation of who he is sitting on his throne in heaven, I mean, when you start to, to speak to him and he starts to reveal to you that he truly is the king and he's glorious and he's mighty. He's the creator of it all. He knows it all. He's the one that can do anything. When you see See him in his glory, then you will start to pray. God, let your kingdom come down here on earth just like it is in heaven. Why do I pray that? Because I just went to heaven in my prayer life. Because I just entered heaven while I was in intercession. And what, what happened up there? I wanted to break out down here. When you pray, you need to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Now, the kingdom of God is based in heaven. We look at heaven and we think that the kingdom of heaven is a place, but it's not a place. We talked about that last week. It's actually a realm of rulership. It's where the king's authority flows. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let me, let me just go through the rest of this real quick. And give us this day our daily bread. That's where you ask for what you want. Sometimes we put that at the top of the list. Lord, I want this and I want that and I need this and give me that and give me this and do this and do that and do. All right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me just like I'm forgiving. 
It's hard to pray that prayer when you're holding bitterness. Hard to pray that prayer when you're fussing at somebody and angry at them and talking about them. And Lord, give me just as much forgiveness as I've been given out. <laughs> what he told us to pray, right? <laughs> and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Why can he deliver us from the evil one? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Why is he a deliverer? Because his kingdom will never, ever end. All the other kingdoms of this world... All the kingdoms we, we wring our hands over, they're going to end. All the problems between one kingdom and another kingdom on this planet, all those problems, they're all going to come to an end. And when they come to an end, there's not going to be any kingdom down here that's going to be the ultimate victor. Amen. He's the one in charge of it all. Woo! Now, when, when I have kingdom praying, you know what it reminds me? Kingdom praying reminds me, I'm not from here. I'm just temporary down here. I'm just visiting. My birth certificate is actually just a visitor's visa. <laughs> just down here for a little while, I'm on my way home. Because my citizenship isn't here. Now, when I, when I get on a plane, I give them my passport, and they say, where are you a citizen from? And I don't mess around with them at that point. <laughs> I've, I have driven through the checkpoint coming into this country from Mexico. You don't mess around at that checkpoint when you go up there. They look at you and they say, where are you a citizen from? And you, you don't make jokes, right? At that point, I'm from the United States of America. Please let me in. Now let me tell you, they look at me and they say, this is, where, this is where you belong. This is where you're from. This is where you're a citizen from. But his word actually tells me differently. I'm here now, but my citizenship isn't here. It's in heaven. I'm on my way somewhere else. I am on my way to the place where I ultimately belong, where I'm really from. I'm a citizen of heaven. And when I start having kingdom-like prayer in my, in my prayer life, you know what? Heaven gets a little bit nearer to me. And all of a sudden, the stuff of this world, I don't care so much about all the junk that's going on down here. Is that good? And I start praying, Lord, let your kingdom come down here. See, that's what we need. We just need a little heaven to break down here on earth, just break out in, in our worship and break out in, in our homes and break out in our family. We need heaven to break out over at Walmart. We need heaven to break out. We need the kingdom of heaven to come down here to earth. It ought to be the cry of our heart. Lord, let your kingdom break out. Don't Help me to not be so earthly and fleshly and carnal minded. Don't let me pray like the heathen are praying because it's all focused on the people that are around me. Lord, I want your kingdom from heaven to break down, break, break out down here on the earth. Amen. You know the closest thing to that? The closest thing to heaven breaking out on earth is when the church worships. When we come together in worship, and we start to exalt his name. And this morning, you know, they're up there and they're singing, he's a miracle worker. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. And that's who he is. Whew. He inhabits the praises of his people. He, this is what the Bible says. He is enthroned. You know what that is? It's kingdom language. He extends the reign of his kingship when his people worship him. 
Is that good? The kingdom of heaven breaks out on the earth in worship. And people go, why do you get so excited? People get all carried away. They're just out there. They're just carrying on. Heaven broke out. My goodness, heaven broke out. It ought to be front page news. Heaven broke out. I don't want to sound negative. I've, I've been in a lot of worship services that were not heavenly. I've been in a lot of worship services where it was like, oh my goodness, how oh, could we get it over with already? That's not here. That wasn't in Ohio. That was in some other... I've been in some places where people were singing songs. I've been in some places where people were singing beautiful songs. But there was no heaven there. There was no breaking out of heaven on this earth. There was no the church coming together in wholehearted worship and just and listen, it's not about that you have to worship like I do. It's not about that you've got to get all carried away and shout and throw your arms and do all that. That's that's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the presence of the Holy Ghost coming down among God's people as we're wholeheartedly in worship, where heaven just kisses earth, and all of a sudden a little bit of heaven breaks out and somebody that's been struggling with depression all of a sudden there's deliverance that starts to break out and someone that's been struggling physically all of a sudden healing starts to break out and someone that's been far from God and they're they're bound by sin they run to the altar and they say God forgive me of my sin I repent I repent and they start their life anew I'm talking about heaven breaking out when God's people worship him. <sighs> Better get to preaching here. He said, when, yeah, that's my warm up, somebody said. <laughs> He said, pray in this manner. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now there's a connection there. When God's kingdom comes in your life, his will will be done in your life. You can't pray God's kingdom come and be seeking your will. My will has to be submitted to his will. Let me get a couple pieces of paper. I got some paper up here. So let's just say this is his will right there. And this is my will right here. I am required to submit, right, my will to him. So to submit means to place under. So now I have his will. I can't even see my will anymore. My goal is no longer, Lord, I want you to do what I want. Now I'm saying, Lord, you've been speaking to me about some things, and that's what I'm praying about. Lord, I'm praying your will be done. Let me tell you, when you, st when you first got saved, you didn't get a, a, a little card to get out of hell free. That was not what your salvation was. Yeah, we didn't play Monopoly and... You know, roll double sixes, and so and you go over there, and you land it on chance, and then you pull the chance card. Woohoo! Get out of hell free. Jesus did not die so you could get your get out of hell free card. 
it was not that he wants to just be your savior. He said, you have entered into a new kingdom. I don't want to just be your savior. I'm not interested in giving you a fire insurance policy to get you out of going to hell. I'm interested in changing you from the inside out. I want to be your king. I want to be your Lord. I want to be your master. I want you to let your life be in submission to me so that it's no longer you that lives, but I will live in you. I want people when they see you to no longer see you. They need to start seeing me. When they look at you, everything that's you is back here. I'm the front page. I'm on top because everything of your will has been submitted to me. Amen. Coming into the kingdom is a different narrative for us. We're not used to this. We don't live in a kingdom. You know, we're, we're in the Western world, we're used to democracy Everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets a voice. Somebody, some people's voices are louder than others. We get these politicians and we elect them and they're supposed to represent us. And they vow that they will until the day they get elected. I'll leave that right there. But the idea being in our system, if we don't like them, we'll just vote them out. Vote somebody else in. We don't like what they did, we'll vote them out. We'll vote somebody else in there. What he's talking about is a kingdom. And there isn't any of that. When you existed in a kingdom, when Jesus talked about the kingdom, they all understood what he was talking about because the king has absolute reign in his kingdom nobody's going to say i don't like that i think we ought to vote maybe we should get a new king he might say that but he'll only say it once and he won't be around to say it again because as long as the king is alive the king reigns. Some of you should be putting two and two together right there. You ought to already be happy. I said as long as the king is alive, the king reigns. The kingdom is known by the lifespan of the king. So when you read in the Old Testament, in the book of, of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you read about all the kings of Israel and of Judah. And all of them say, you know, they'll say, this king reigned for 20 years. This king, his kingdom, he reigned for 40 years. Right? Because the, once he was crowned king, his reign is determined by how long he is alive. So if we have a kingdom that is forever and ever, and every time we pray, we say, your kingdom, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. What you're saying is your kingdom reigns because you're alive. You are alive. You're alive forevermore. No one will ever take you off the throne. It might seem in the situation when the devil is roaring all around around you like God has been removed from the throne. But rest assured, the king is still alive. The king is still on the throne. The king still reigns. <laughs> See, we kind of don't get that because we don't live it under that type of a system. But as long as the king is reigning, he's in charge. And you know what you do? You do what the king says. If the king sends out a decree and says, In my kingdom, everyone shall wear purple on Thursdays. You better wear purple on Thursday. Right? 
The king put, it out, put out a decree. And when the king makes a decree, everyone in the kingdom better listen to what the king said because he's the king. You don't have to always agree with the king. You don't have to even understand what the king's doing. You just better follow after the king. Somebody say amen. amen. But it's more than just following the rules. In this kingdom, when you walk in obedience to him, he gives great promise. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, Paul defines the kingdom. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink. You don't get in the kingdom by just following some rules. We always like to boil it down, don't we? We always like to get a little, boy, if we could just get a little three-step process. He said, listen, it's not just following the rules because, you know, you can follow the rules and have your heart be far from the king. He said, listen, it is the realm of the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom of God. The realm of the Holy Spirit. And it's filled with three things. The first one is what? What? Righteousness. Not just following the rules. He wants you to be righteous. Righteousness means right living. Righteousness, literally, in, in, in this word, if you break it down in Greek, it means how you treat other people in relationships and how you treat God in relationship with him. It is living right, doing what is right. Who determines what's right? The king. It's when you walk in obedience to the king in what you do in living your life in relationship to other people and in relationship to him. So when the Holy Spirit starts to convict you of something, you don't just push it aside and go, oh, that's okay. I like this. I'm just going to keep on. Righteousness means I don't want the stuff of the kingdoms of this world to get a hold of me. I want, that, I want to be delivered and set free from that stuff. Somebody say amen. I want to stop making excuses for living a worldly life. I want to live a holy life, a godly life, a righteous life. Somebody say amen right there. Do we still believe in holiness? It is, is, is it still the standard for God's people that we should attempt to live a holy life as empowered by the Holy Spirit? It? Now, now catch this. When you're filled with righteousness, then you are filled with two other things. Righteousness, peace, and joy. When you follow this king, he says, listen, here's the deal. You live right before me, you're going to have peace and you're going to have joy like you will never experience anywhere else. You try to do your will. You try to get what you want. You try to make yourself happy. You try to get your way. You're going to have nothing but problems and struggle. And it's going to be hard. And you're going to get frustrated. And you're going to not understand why isn't this happening. But when you just submit and say, God, I'm just going to follow after your plan. I don't have to understand. all the, You know what comes over you? The peace of the Holy Ghost. You know what you get? You get joy that the world can't take away because the, the source of the joy isn't from the world. It's from heaven where the king is. Is that good? When you surrender to the king, he's promising you peace. He's promising you joy. I oh, mean, I need to hurry. Now, we talked about the Lord's Prayer. We acknowledge his name and we pray his kingdom. Now, when Jews would hear what Jesus said there, they would hearken back to a psalm. They would think of Psalm 91. Now, many of you know it. Psalm 91 is the first of several kingly psalms. If you want to read psalms that declare him as king, creator, as God, as royalty, read all Psalm 91 all the way up to Psalm 100, and you'll see that he's the creator, he's the most high, he's the almighty, he is the Lord, he is supreme, he's above everything and everyone else. It, it speaks of his kingdom. 
But I want us to look at Psalm 91 for a moment. How many of y'all have heard Psalm 91? Most of you. Again, I've preached on Psalm 91 before. It's really awesome. Here's what you need to know about Psalm 91. There are three voices in Psalm 91. There are three voices. At the beginning, voice one is kind of supposed to be our voice as we're reading it. It is saying, I rely on the Lord. He's my fortress. He is the king. And I'm placing myself under the covering of the one who is almighty. I put myself in his kingdom. You catching that? And then voice two, which is the majority of, of the psalm, it's starting in verse three down to verse 13, is a second voice. And that second voice is speaking to you if you have come into the kingdom. That second voice is speaking about how you're going to be preserved by God and what God's going to do for you. But then when you read it's starting in verse 14, you read, and God himself, the king, starts speaking over you. Listen for the three voices. Let's, let's look at it. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. You see that? That's the, that's the first person speaking. But then the second person speaks to the first person and says this, Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you'll take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample under foot. So now you've heard two voices, Right? I hope you're in his kingdom, so yours is the first voice, and then the second voice you hear is the voice returning back of all the promises because you're in his kingdom. Right. Now, listen to the mighty third voice. Now God's going to speak, and listen to what he says. Because he has set his love upon me, Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, as you read that, here's what I want you to see. This is not in a personal form. This is not, many times God speaks in the word directly to you. But this isn't that. This was not God say, if it was personal, he would say, because you have set your love on me, I will deliver you. But he didn't say that. You notice that? He isn't speaking to you. This is the language of a king's proclamation. Because you've come under the covering of the king, you've got promises over you, and then the king, sitting on the throne, made a declaration to everyone in his kingdom about you. The king is not just speaking to you. Now the king is saying, hear ye, hear ye. Let everybody know the king is now speaking. And here's my will. Here's my word. This is what I'm saying over, over this one who is in my kingdom. 
And this is what he, he's, he's giving a kingdom principle here for all the people that are under his authority, under his reign. He says, I will deliver him. You know, you have a promise of deliverance when you come to the Lord. It's a promise. The king declared it on the throne. If he doesn't do what he said, then he wouldn't be a God of his word. So he's provided for your deliverance already. Now, some of you say, well, I'm saved. But let me tell you, there's some deliverance that needs to happen. There's some junk of the world that gets a hold of you. And some of us sometimes just, you need to have something off of you, delivered and set free. Some of you are walking in torment that you ought not be walking in because you are called to be in the kingdom. And in the kingdom, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. He's not called you to live in, in the torment of the enemy in your mind. He's not called you to walk in fear. He's not called you to walk in doubt. He has not called you to walk in sin. He's not called you to walk in lewdness. He's not called you to, to have the, your mind be a playground for the devil. Somebody say amen. He's called you to walk in righteousness, peace, and joy. He's called you to live a different kind of life. He said, I will deliver him. And then what does he say? I will set him on high. What does that mean? God promised in the proclamation to set you on high. You know what that is? It's kingly language. When the king says, you are no longer a servant. You are no longer just a slave in the kingdom. I'm exalting you. I'm bringing you up in my kingdom to extend my kingdom wherever you go. Are you hearing this? He's saying, I am giving you my authority. The authority of the king is in his name. What did Jesus say? He said, ask the Father anything in my name. Jesus' name is the name above every other name because he is the king of all kings. And he said, I'm extending my kingdom by, 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 by all those of you who are coming under my covering. I am going to raise you up on high and invest authority into you as a joint heir with Christ. Let me tell you, that, doesn't, that ought to not make us puffed up. It ought to make us realize our responsibility. Amen. Are you hearing me? The devil wants to convince you that you're a nothing and you're a nobody and you're not worthy. The devil wants to tell you, well, God listens to everybody else and he doesn't listen to you. The devil wants to tell you, well, you pray and God doesn't hear. The devil wants to tell you, well, you're just struggling in sin and you're just barely, if you can just make it there yourself. The devil's a liar and he's the father of lies. Your father in heaven said, I'm the king and I've put a declaration over you. I'm telling you, I am calling you to come up higher. I'm not calling you to live down here among all this earthly, worldly, carnal stuff. I'm calling you to righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Why is he entrusting responsibility to you in the kingdom? He said it right there. Because he has known what? My name. Because he's known my name. Now, do you remember what Jesus said when Jesus gave the model prayer? He said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you address him, you have to know his name. Understanding his name is a key that unlocks the kingdom. 
Are you catching that? I'll set you on high because you have known my name. What name? Well, now let's, let's look at that because this is Psalm 91. Of course, Jesus would come about a thousand years later. God is known by many, 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 many names all throughout Scripture. Which one's he talking about? Now, to Jews, the Jews would say this is the mystery of his name. The mystery of his name. Because his name is hallowed. That means his name is sacred. That means his name should never be said or spoken without considering the ramifications and understanding the gravity of who he is because he is the king of all kings. You, you should not ever say his name flippantly. You know, people curse in a lot of different ways. But it's an affront to his kingdom to use his name in vain. Is that good? You understanding that? Jews had a lot of different names for God, but there was one that was the most special of all. The most special of all, he, he told to a guy who asked him what his name was. Remember that guy? Moses. Moses said, hey, you're telling me to go down here and tell Pharaoh, you know, let, let my people go. Uh, who are you? <laughs> Suppose he asked me who sent me. Uh, what should I say, Bush? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of an important thing, right? A bush told me to tell you. People say, hey, we better get the straitjacket guys in here. The bush told him. Fiery bush told him. God said, I am that I am. He said, I'm the self-existent one. I am the one that created everything else. I'm the one that decided that there should be time, so I created time. I'm the one that decided that there should be a universe, so there was nothing. There was not even any space, and I decided that there should be a universe, so I spoke, and the universe existed because I spoke. And then I am upholding all things by the power of my word alone. I'm the self-existent one. I am that I am. You can tell them that. But then he goes on, and if you read there in Exodus, he, he says, you know, I, I want to know your name, and he says that he's the Lord, but in Hebrew it's kind of unique because they never finished writing it. In Hebrew, they felt like this name of God, and he said, this is my covenant name for how long? Forever. Why would it be forever? Oh, because his kingdom will last forever because the king is still alive and he's reigning and he's on the throne. So this is his kingdom name. And he said, this is my covenant name to you forever and ever and ever. Know me by this name. And Moses went to write it down and he said, that name is too holy for me to write down. I can't even write it. The Jews believed that they couldn't even speak it. It was so holy. The Jews would not write it because they said, if we write it, David, so holy that we would be making a graven image and breaking this commandment of the Lord to even write it out. So instead of writing it out, they took the vowels out and they only gave us the consonants. And there, so it's four letters that are written in Hebrew. And this is what it looks like. It's Y-H-W-H -H with no vowels in it. 
because it's so holy. Now, we throw some vowels in there so that we can guess what his name would have been if it would have been written out. And we call him Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord, God, Almighty, the King, the one who reigns, the one with all might and all power in the kingdom. And he said, do you know my name? Not just Savior, not just get out of hell free card, not just, oh yeah, the one that I went to his house on Sunday and I heard somebody talk about. Do you know him as your king? See, it's different when you say, he's the one that directs every step of my path. I don't want to even take a breath without him. I want to walk in obedience to him. I want to submit my will to his will. I want to make sure that he is the king. He is the one that is God almighty. He's the covering that is over me continually. He is the one. He says, stand up and I'll stand up. He says, sit down and I'll sit down. He says, jump. And I say, how high? When you know him in that way, then you can call on his kingdom to come. See, we see him as king and as the creator of the universe. Is he your king? Is he your king? Is there any area in your life that he's not king of? And now we make that personal. Now we apply that to where we're at. Is there any area in your thought life that he's not the king of? Is there any area where if God said, no, I don't want you to do that, you would resist him? Because if he's not king of all, then he's not king at all. He is the Lord God Almighty. Is that a good word? And it's his church ought to spend less time worrying, and wringing our hands, and complaining. And more time declaring, he's the king. I talked to the king. The king told me that he has sent me here on assignment. Now, I'm on my way to that kingdom. But while I'm here, I want that kingdom to break out down here on earth. Now, with that in mind, I want you to reread what he said here in Psalm 91. Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. The king just proclaimed it. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Again, he says it again. I will deliver him and I will honor him with long life. I will satisfy him. I will show him my salvation. Those are promises of God to King's kids. I'm telling you, you're a joint heir with Christ. He's saying, you came in to my kingdom, and in my kingdom, I'm going to deliver. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to be with you in trouble. Lord, let your kingdom come in Conneaut, Ohio. All of us have tendencies to have fleshly kingdoms in our heart. We used to sing a little chorus years ago. Just said, Jesus be the Lord of all. Do you remember that? Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart. Because a lot of times stuff gets built up in here that ought not be there. Today, he wants surrender. I said today, he wants surrender. 
as they're coming to the instruments this morning. Is there an area of your life that has not yet been completely surrendered to the king? He wants you to walk in a new level as a king's kid. But you can't do it when you have kingdoms of this world. We build idols, not out of wood and not out of stone. We build idols out of stuff and things and ideas, things that we're so passionate about. And God says, could you lay that down? What's he been dealing with you about? What's he been speaking to you about? Listen, for those of you who maybe have felt like you're far from the Lord, you think, man, I got a whole lot of stuff to work on. The good news is this. He's the king. All it takes is surrender to him. Let him do the work. Let him do the work in you. Let the Holy Spirit begin to be the one leading and guiding. Stop living by your will. Start submitting your will to his will. Make him king of every area. Today we're going to pray. I'm going to ask heads bowed and eyes closed all over the room. And this is not just a prayer for people that maybe don't know the Lord. I want every single one of us to search our heart today because he wants you and I to come to a new level in his kingdom. And we can't go there dragging the baggage of the world along with us. We got to get rid of that stuff. So right now, as I just play softly, would you just begin to talk to the Lord? Maybe you already know what the Lord's been dealing with you about. Maybe there's something that you just need to ask the Lord, Lord, what is there in my life? What kingdoms? You know, Maybe there's just a selfishness. Maybe there's a self-centeredness. Maybe there's a pride in your life. Maybe there are some things that the Lord's dealt with you about and you've laid them down before, but you know you've taken them back up again. And right now, in his presence, could we just come and say, Lord, I surrender to you. I surrender. I surrender. You're the king, and I don't want to give you most of my life. I don't want to give you part of my life. I don't want to give you some of my life. I want to give you all, all. I surrender all. Holy Spirit, right now, Lord, deal with each heart. God, I know that you have a place that you're taking this church. I know that in 2019, you're speaking your kingdom coming over us. And this morning is a time of preparation for that. God, we just lay our heart out before you. There are some of you, you've allowed sin to come into your life. And you know it's between you and the Lord. It's not anybody else. It's just you and the Lord. You know you need to repent right now and say, Lord, forgive me of sin. God, forgive me of sin. I have sinned before you. And I repent of that sin. Over and over today, we've read he's promised to deliver us. How does he deliver us? He delivers us when we come and we repent. That's where deliverance begins, right there. God, I pray you'd set some people free this morning. God, I pray you'd set some people free. Deliver, Lord. Because, God, it's your desire that you would be able to set us on high to be an extension of your kingdom. So we don't want anything holding us back to the kingdoms of this world. Right now, God, we just come in complete commitment and surrender to you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
We surrender, Lord. Be the Lord of every area. Hallelujah. 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 The Holy Spirit's just still working on some hearts right now. I'm not trying to just belabor this, but right now, the Holy Spirit's still working on some hearts. Don't put this off. Don't put this off. If you're kind of on the fence on this, I'm just telling you, you need to surrender to Him. There's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost on the other side of your surrender. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand this morning? Lord, I thank you that you are the King. You are the one who delivers us. You're the one that sets us free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we leave here, We're going to make a declaration. It was about 4.30 this morning that I woke up. And immediately I felt the enemy start to jump on my mind about something. I know none of y'all have ever had that. Immediately I just felt this attack of the enemy. And I felt the Lord speak over me the words that we declared last Sunday. When the watchman is on the wall in Isaiah and he's looking for report of the kingdom and the the Bible said how lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring good news. The good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus came to preach. Announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. And what was the report? That the king reigns. Right? So I want us to know if you would put that last slide up for me. I want us to make this declaration. I want us to leave here with these words on our lips God reigns, He is the King. Say it God reigns, He is the King. Come on, say it. God reigns reigns. He is the king. Declare it. God reigns. He is the king. Say it over your situation. God reigns. He is the king. Let hell hear you. God reigns. He is the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Over Conneaut, Ohio. God reigns. He's the king over your marriage. God reigns. He's the king over your health. God reigns. He is the king. He's the king. He's the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our elders and our leaders, their spouses, to come quickly and stand right up here. I need some intercessors to come right up here very quickly to pray with people today. If you need somebody to pray with you, they're going to declare God's kingdom over you. God reigns. God reigns. God reigns. He's the king. He's the king. He's still alive. He's still on the throne. He's going to be with me in trouble. He reigns. He reigns. He's the king and he reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need a miracle of healing today, I just want to tell you something. God reigns. He's the king. So I'm believing for miracles happening this morning. Amen. If you want to come and you need a greater level of commitment this morning, he's the deliverer. He's the one that will set you free. You need God to do a miracle and the impossible. Let me tell you, God reigns. He's the king. He's the king. Somebody say amen.
Amen. I'm going to ask our youth pastor to pray a dismissal prayer, and then the altar is open for you to come. God, for your timely word. God, as a church and as a body, Father, we're believing for some big things this year. God, we're believing for big things in our homes, God, in our community. God, that you are on your throne. God, we are crying out to a big God this morning. God, that you are on your throne and that you reign and that you are king, God. Lord, I thank you today. Father, as we leave this place, God, we leave here proclaiming this week that you reign and you are on your throne. In the name of Jesus, amen.